Hello, hello. Can you hear me? Is this working? No funciona, no? Ah, si sí funciona. Hola, buen día. Good morning. Welcome to the morning session of the second day of uh, the LNLP. Uh, I, sorry, the LBCN second edition. Um, so this is going to be about natural language processing. As you know, NLP has been uh, a core matter of artificial intelligence since the very beginnings. And also it has been uh, connected to machine learning and these days uh, very strongly connected to deep learning. Um, so um, I'm really glad to introduce uh, Marta Ruiz Costa Josa as our invited speaker this morning. <coughs> Marta is a Ramonica Hall researcher at the Polytechnic University of Catalonia these days. Um, she's uh, very well known by his work, her work done on uh, cross-lingual uh, methods and in particular to machine translation. And uh, the ones who know her, you, you know that she has been extremely active during all these years um, in both researching and teaching in different uh, academ academic uh, uh, universities um, around the world. So uh, to mention some places, he sh she has been uh, in, in Barcelona, in, in France, she has been in Singapore, she has been also in the UK, in Brazil, in Mexico. Am I missing any? <laughs> so, but today we are very lucky that she's here and she's gonna talk uh, to all of us about this uh, very interesting topic about uh, gender bias in, in NLP. And yeah, I don't want to steal any more minutes from her, so enjoy the presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Luis, for such a nice, uh, a nice introduction. Uh, I'm very happy to be here. It's, it's an honor to be uh, speaking in this symposium. Um, well, I'm going to talk uh, about gender bias in natural language processing. First of all, I want to start with, with a logic riddle that says the following. A man and his son are in a terrible accident and are rushed to the hospital in critical care. The doctor looks at the boy and exclaims, I can't operate on this boy. He is my son. Okay. How can this be? So the man and his son are in an accident and the doctor says, this is my son? Well, uh, I'm sure that those that do not know about this riddle have not thought about the, that the doctor is the mother of the boy. And here is where uh, gender bias come, in the sense that we, are, uh, we have this uh, biases in our mind that we relate that doctors are more related to male than to female, nurses are more related to female than to males, and this is just part of a long list of professional bias that we have that at the same time it's just uh, part of the unconscious bias that we as humans have for growing up in a culture in, uh, with uh, some I ideals from our parents, uh, professors, uh, and so on. This unconscious bias comes in many flavors. Uh, one of them is the professions bias that I have mentioned, and which are part of the stereotypes. Stereotypes meaning that diet is more associated to women, and hero is more associated to male. Uh, other types of unconscious bias as are this out of group homogeneity. So me as an European, I uh, uh, have sometimes a hard time distinguishing between some Asian cultures and I think the other way around is uh, the same. Um, and all these unconscious bias that we have, that there are many more that I have not mentioned, they are written in our data, okay? And even much, uh, much more polarized in our data, in the sense that what we write is more uh, extreme than what we speak. So since we humans inherit biases, because uh, we, we live in cultures and we inherit these biases, are maybe machines, uh, automatic systems, the solutions, because they are not humans, they do, are not raised up in cultures and so on. 
let's see that. Uh, natural language processing, of course, you know that it uh, focuses on programming uh, computers to process and analyze natural language. Natural language applications are uh, machine translation, personal assistants, and so on. Uh, natural language processing systems are trained on data, okay, on this data that I was talking about, okay, on data that we produce. So uh, you, you know where I'm going, no? This data is biased. And we train our models on this data, and then we interpret our models. Mm, we know that our data, and because I, I have told you, is biased because we create it. But much more than uh, this inherited bias that the data, ha the data has is how we collect the data. So uh, here we have a map of Amazon Mechanical Turk workers, and we see that they are more located in the US and uh, the, uh, in Europe, and they are not, the, these workers are not representative of the entire world, the entire uh, variety of cultures that we have, uh, uh, languages, and so on. Uh, so if our, uh, annotate, our, our annotators are not representative, our annotations are also biased. And we have these associations uh, that I was speaking about uh, because of uh, our cultures and so on. And here we, we know that the coreference annotation is biased because her is more associated to secretary and his is more associated to physician. So, uh, the bias that we have in the data is the bias that we uh, put in our data, the one that we put in collection, and the one that we add in annotation. All these uh, biases in our data are, uh, imp are the input of our model, and uh, then we interpret our bias models. That, again, is a biased interpretation. Because uh, if we look up, for example, here, an example, uh, in the sense that I look uh, for, uh, for an image uh, with the word housekeeper, and I get these photos that most of them, well, all of them except for one that there appears a man, are women, then I can interpret that all women, uh, I, all housekeepers are women. Uh, this is an overgeneralization, and it's a biased interpretation. So. The answer to my first question is that are syst automatic systems a solution to our bias? Uh, not quite, no, because uh, natural language processing learns from a biased data and uh, our models are biased. Okay, so uh, now I'm going to uh, discuss some of the work that we have done in, at our research gr group um, in three directions uh, towards at the very end, what we want is to mitigate gender bias in natural language processing. Uh, but with this, uh, I'm going to discuss how to properly evaluate this gender bias, because we need m m measures to evaluate the gender bias in natural language processing. Then uh, the, the biased algorithms that we have proposed uh, to produce fair systems if we have uh, unbalanced data. And finally, how to uh, generate balanced data. Okay, first of all, evaluation. Uh, you know about words embeddings, that is the transformation of words into, into vectors, okay? We do this by analyzing the context. One step for, uh, beyond words embeddings are the contextual words embeddings, where each word has a different representation depending on the sentence that this word is placed on. So, for example, Mary and Joanna play basketball. This play has a different word vector than in the second sentence, because play has different meanings in the two sentences. Uh, there are uh, different ways to compute this contextual word embedding, different approaches. We are going to use ELMO, because it uses words instead of subwords, and we want to analyze uh, the mm, gender bias at the word level. Uh, but before that, let me speak, uh, uh, refer to one word that has been done uh, in detecting bias in words embeddings, okay? There, is sever there are several words. Uh, there is, uh, especially this one, Kalistan uh, from 2017, that replicate a spectrum of biases from using words embeddings, okay? 
and they uh, show that uh, concepts ones and attributes one are related and concepts two and attributes two are related. And these relations show different types of biases. One is a morally neutral uh, bias towards uh, insects or flowers. For example, we have these flowers, uh, buttercup, daisy, and so on, that they are more related to pleasant attributes. And the insects, the other way around, they are uh, related to unpleasant attributes. Um, however, uh, there are also problematic uh, biases towards race or gender. We have European American names associated to pleasant attributes, whereas African American names are associated to unpleasant attributes. And finally, we have what I have been discussing up to now with examples is that uh, words embeddings reflect the distribution of gender with respect of careers or first names. So males uh, are more associated to math, while female is more associated to poetry, art, dance, and so on. Okay, so uh, once uh, contextual words embeddings were proposed, we uh, wanted to evaluate if this contextual, to measure if these contextual words embeddings also contain biases. For this, we proposed three experiments. Uh, based on the experiments that were proposed for words embeddings uh, uh, previously and modifying accordingly to the new uh, structure of the contextual word embeddings. We propose three uh, to adapt three measures. One is detecting the gender space and the direct bias. Another one is to uh, do word clustering and finally a classification. Okay? We do this on English-German. Uh, uh, tested, uh, we use, uh, but we evaluate on the English part. Um, sorry, uh, the, the corpus is the English German, but we did the, the English part, of course. Uh, well, for these experiments, we, uh, we use uh, the following list. One is a definitional list of 10 pairs containing gendered words. He, she, man, woman, boy, girl, and and up to 10 pairs. Then uh, we have a bias list, which contains 1,000 uh, words, 500 females and, and 500 male biased, where we have uh, words like diet for female, uh, hero for male. We have an extended version of this uh, bias list. And finally, we have a professional list of neutral professions, okay, about 319 tokens. Okay, the first experiment, detecting a gender space and the, and the direct bias. Here, what we want to prove is that there is gender information encoded in, in our uh, contextual word vectors, and that uh, if we, uh, uh, we want to measure how uh, neutral words in the professional list uh, are contain this uh, gender information, okay? This, this, this gender vector that, do, that, we, that we have proven. First, to detect this gender vector, uh, to find out this gender vector, we randomly sample sentences that contain words from the definitional list, okay? Remember, he, she, and so on. Swap the definitional word with its pairwise equivalent from the opposite gender. We get the ELMO embeddings for the word and the swap equivalents and compute the difference, okay, between the, the, the key and the she. And then on the set of the different vectors, we compute the principal components to verify the presence of, of gender information. That was the first step that I was mentioning. And we repeat the same for an equivalent list of random words. Okay, of course, in the random words, we do not do the swapping. Here on the, on the left, we have the, P, uh, the principal components analysis for the definitional words, and on the right, for the random words. What we see is that for the definitional words, we, the, the first component uh, ha, uh, ha is, is much more higher in the, than in the case of random words. Then we assume that the first component has an information of gender, because there, these were gender, uh, uh, gender words. And we use this information, okay, uh, as uh, the, 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 the gender vector. 
And what we do to measure the, di the direct bias is compute the similarity between the gender vector and the vector representation of the neutral uh, profession, the, the profession list that we have that were neutral words. And what we see is that there is a higher association that we would like, 0.03, okay? Uh, if they were random words, I mean, I, uh, neutral words that they do not contain gender information at all, this would be lower. It's true that it's lower than in the case of words embeddings. So in contextual word embeddings, we are kind of uh, reducing it. Then for the second experiment. The second experiment is computed on the bias list. And what we, want is, uh, what we do is clusterize this bias list, okay, the, the embeddings of this bias list, into two groups using k-means, into two clusters. And what we see is the accuracy uh, gets to 70%. Okay, so again, is uh, lower than in words embeddings, but still uh, uh, showing that there is information of, uh, of gender in, in this, in this, in this and, and information of bias in this, in this world. And finally, a similar exper experiment to the, to the second one is the classification between uh, male and female. So if we are able to classify our extended uh, bias list uh, accurately classified, it's bad for us because, I mean, uh, we wouldn't like to, uh, to know from the embeddings if uh, these words are female or, fem or male. But unfortunately, we get a high accuracy, 85%. Uh, which also shows the presence of bias in this uh, contextual words embeddings. And to end up with this evaluation procedure, I want to show you a visualization uh, of, of these words embeddings, okay, an example uh, of these contextual words embeddings, sorry. Uh, uh, I have uh, two sentences, okay. I've known him for a long time. My friend works as a personal financial advisor and the feminine version of this sentence. And then I look for the, uh, uh, the place where this, uh, well, we, um, we plot the visualization of the contextual words embeddings of, the, of personal, advisor, and financial in both sentences, in the male version and in the female version. And we see that financial, uh, male version, and fin uh, female are represented in the same part of the space, advisor in, in, together in the male and female version, and personal uh, together, which is nice because it's what we want. Because I mean, the meaning of those words does not change. It's not like the example that I showed about play, that play changes the, the meaning. Here, the meaning is the same, just it's male or female in a, in a male or female context. But here, uh, we have a problem. So I've known him for a long time. My friend works as a financial manager and the feminine version here what we get is that representation of the male financial and male manager is different than female f uh, financial and female manager. Okay, so uh, we, uh, here we are visualizing also the, the bias that we were mentioning in, in our measures. So as conclusions for this uh, evaluation uh, thing is that words, uh, uh, contextual words embeddings uh, seem to mitigate bias when comparing in absolute values with words embeddings, uh, but they still preserve uh, gender bias. Okay. And well, uh, now I'm moving to the second point that I wanted to explain: that it's uh, can we the bias our algorithms so that if they are trained on unbalanced data, unbalanced data, they produce fair uh, outputs. Well. Uh, in this case, I'm, I'm moving to the field of machine translation, and I want to show several examples where uh, I, I show that machine translation also exhibits bias. Uh, we have this typical example that you might have seen. is She's a doctor in, in English, and you translate into Turkish. You get something that I cannot pronounce. And then from this Turkish, you back translate into English again, and you get he's a doctor. This happens because Turkish does not contain, uh, is, is not a morphological inflected language, so uh, the, the, the sentence in Turkish does not contain the gender information, so uh, the translation system outputs what is more probable. You might argue that this is not biased because, okay, uh, the, the translation system does not have the information, so simply outputs what is most probable. But, okay, uh, if you are with that, I have another example uh, where you translate from Malay into English and look at the second sentence that is, Jezeline is a female, 
this is the translation that we get from the Malay, he works as a programmer. Okay, here you are explicitly encoding that Jezeline is a female, and still you say he is a programmer. So here, this, what I assume is that the stereotype is so strong that the attention-based mechanisms that are uh, inside the transformer of the translation system are not capable to, to counterpart this stereotype. Uh, the, the, there have been some proposals already that it's to solve this problem, that it's, for example, in the case of having uh, 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 you go from a low inflected language to a high inflected language, and do you, not, you do not have the information of gender, you output both possibilities, okay? Uh, what we have done is um, uh, our experiments consist in using an already proposed uh, the bias words embeddings techniques and include them in the architecture of the machine translation system. Okay, uh, so we use a, 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 a base, the, the transformer baseline, and we, we test with different embeddings, pre-trained embeddings, classical, global, uh, and two version, two versions of these embeddings that are the biased. And we, we do this for an English-Spanish uh, task. The two versions of the words embeddings the bias consist in the following ones. One is the bias after training, okay? So we define a gender direction, as I have uh, shown in the evaluation measures. Uh, we define inherently neutral words, nurse as opposed to, so nurse is neutral, but mother is not, no? So we have a list of neutral words, and then we remove the gender directions from those neutral words, okay? So and we have the bias words embeddings. And then another version of the bias word embeddings is uh, train words embeddings using GLOVE, uh, alter the loss to encourage the gender information to concentrate in the last coordinate, and then uh, ignore the last coordinate so that we have also uh, uh, words embeddings without gender information. We have these two techniques that we input in our translation system as pre-trained words embeddings. What we first want to show in this English to Spanish task is that our blue measure does not decrease from the baseline transformer because, okay, we want uh, the bias system, but we want uh, the accuracy of the, 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 the performance of the system to be the same. Uh, so we have this baseline, blue the higher the better. So we have the, the baseline 29.78, and we have introducing pre-trained words embeddings that are not the bias, increases a little bit the blue, and then we have uh, uh, using the hard debiasing technique that the bias words embeddings uh, decreases compared to the pre-trained embeddings, but increases compared to the baseline system. And finally, with, uh, with uh, the, uh, the bias during training, we have uh, a little bit of, of improvement over both baselines, the pre-trained and the baseline. Uh, then, once we have shown that the quality of the system is more or less the same, so we are not, at least we are not uh, uh, providing systems that are lower quality from the baseline system, we want to show if, we want to test if our system is the bias, so uh, mitigates the gender bias that we have. We do that by creating a test set, because that's one problem that we have, that we do not have uh, uh, ways to uh, properly evaluate the bias in machine translation. So we, we created this one, that it's uh, basically, there are four test sets uh, of 1,000 sentences. Test one and test two consist of the following. I've known her for test one, I've known him for test two. For a long time, my friend works as a and the translation is, uh, the key here is to translate my friend into my amiga or, or amigo. For the occupations, we took uh, 1,000 occupations list from the US Bureau of Labor Statistics, okay? So accounting clerk, contable, doctor, nurse, whatever. Uh, then we have another version of this test, but including, uh, instead of her or him, substituting by names, by proper names, uh, popular ones, Mary and John. And here we have the accuracy of translating amiga or amigo. And we see that in the four test sets, when doing the hard the biasing, we get a 100% accuracy in translating amiga and amigo. Uh, we, uh, which is an, an improvement compared to the, to the baseline system that we had. 
Okay, so the conclusions in this, in this part is that um, we have similar translation quality and we have less biased gender predictions. The limitations of this approach is that, okay, we are based on the biased uh, words embeddings, that it has been recently been proved that this, the biased words embeddings, this, uh, the biased techniques that I have present, that, I, uh, that we have used in the, in the system, uh, they contain still, they exhibit bias. So they, they, they still exhibit bias. And also we are using pre-trained words embeddings and retraining the embeddings in the system. So it's possible that we are retraining those biases when, when learning the system. Okay, and the last point that I wanted to, to mention is this uh, generating fair data sets, okay? Can, can better than the biasing algorithms, maybe easier, it's to produce uh, fair data sets. Uh, one related word that I wanted to discuss is this one um, from the University of Copenhagen that they, they say, okay, when you go from a low inflected language to a high inflected language, sometimes you do not have enough information to generate the, the right translation. This is the case of, for example, if I say in English, I am happy uh, and I want to translate into Spanish. If the system does not know that I, that I, uh, I, am, uh, I am a girl, uh, uh, in my output, estoy contento. Uh, no, and the translation is, estoy contenta. Then if the system has the gender of the speaker, it will help the system to uh, disambiguate these cases. Okay, so what they do in this work is they annotate data sets with the speaker information. And they, uh, what they get is an improvement in blue in some language pairs. Uh, uh, the approach that I wanted to present that we uh, have done uh, at, uh, at our group and in cooperation here with Christina is uh, following this, uh, this idea of that um, we have underrepresentation of females in our data sets, okay? And here we have an example of dimensions of males and females in textual description of books uh, following a period, okay? In blue, we have dimension to males, and in pink, following the right bias, pink for females and blue for males, uh, in female, we have the representation of, of, of females. We see that this representation of females is much lower than, than the male. Then, okay, if our data set represents better males than females, let's try and balance it. Uh, that's our idea. So we use, uh, we um, propose this GeoBio toolkit that it's built on top of laser uh, that you might be familiar with laser. Is, is this toolkit is proposed by Facebook and it's used to extract parallel sentences from multilingual text. And they have uh, used this toolkit to extract a large data set called Wikimatrix, where you have uh, multilingual uh, parallel data at the level of sentence. Uh, so based on that, what we say, okay, we are going to adapt this toolkit uh, and use it in Wikipedia biographies to provide gender balanced data sets. Okay, uh, so this toolkit is customizable, customizable in the number of languages to use, extracts multilingual parallel, parallel uh, text at the level of sentence from Wikipedia biographies, con, uh, and it has the, the option of, say, of saying that it wants uh, the same number of males biographies and, and females biographies. And also it contains document information in the sense that we are extracting uh, parallel sentences at the, uh, at the level of document, but of course it's um, cons uh, consistent in the sense that uh, uh, sentences belong to the same document, but you might have gaps inside the document. Uh, okay, we evaluated the quality of the parallel sentences that we extracted. And well, we ex selected 50 sentences in three languages, English, Spanish, Catalan. We used, uh, we uh, asked seven different native fluent speakers uh, to score a tuple uh, with one if it conveys the same meaning and zero otherwise. 
and we reach on average 87.5% uh, uh, accuracy. Uh, but well, the majority vote is 96, so let me sell our, <laughs> it's better, <laughs> ah, five, mi five minutes, okay, I'm almost done. So, okay, and we computed the inter annotation agreement, 67%. Uh, also, we provide, uh, with this toolkit, we provide a GeoView corpus of 2,000 sentences, uh, so in the, same language pair, uh, in the same languages, English, Spanish, and Catalan, we extracted 2,000 sentences that we post-edited. Uh, so these sentences are uh, uh, parallel 100%. And um, we also annotated the topic information, so the, 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 the profession of the, of, the, of the biography character. Okay, and this, this toolkit, we are going to use, it, uh, this toolkit, this corpus, we are going to use it uh, for evaluation in machine translation because it's, it's, it's it's uh, perfect uh, translation. And well, uh, some examples of this corpus, the statistics of this corpus, it's, uh, the important thing about this is that it's 30,000 words in all languages. And as a conclusion is that you can use GeoView Toolkit to uh, extract multilingual gender balanced data sets and GeoView Corpus to evaluate, and, and we plan to extend this, this GeoView Corpus to have, uh, as I said, uh, evaluation, uh, evaluation corpus for machine translation that it's balanced and, and so on. And as a, as a wrap up of the entire talk, is this the biasing uh, that we are doing what we want? Well, it is, but it is limited because it is limited to gender and it's difficult to uh, Ex uh, generalize to other types of biases like race and demographic and all others. Is this the bias always desirable? Because I, I mean, at the end, machine learning is about learning biases. So or removing attributes might remove information. But okay, the, the answer to this claim, uh, to, to, to this um, argument is that Okay, gender information in natural language processing might be harming the, 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 the systems that, that, that we are uh, uh, providing to the society and might be causing uh, unfair results. And also, uh, this is all the work that I have presented is done from the natural language point processing uh, point of view. And what this is, is a social problem. So what we need is to uh, uh, cooperate with uh, socialists, philosophers, and so on to face this problem, which is a very, very big problem. And well, arguments for doing research in this and joining, uh, joining the community and contributing is that unconscious bias can be really harmful. Uh, the bias in computer systems might help in the biasing society. And well, uh, gender uh, bias causes NLP systems to make errors. So even if you only care about accuracy, you should care about this. Okay, now, did you hear me that you are supposed to make questions now? <laughs> we still have 10 minutes. I went to the end. Thank you. Hi, uh, thank you for the talk. Um, do you think, or are you planning to like extrapolate this gender bias to, well, I mean, these kind of, uh, of models to other kind of biases? Yeah, towards uh, race or, uh, uh, yeah, exactly. That's, that's yeah, of course, the, this is gender, it's, it's a, a binary problem, so it's easy in that sense, so, but the very first idea is to start with this to, ex, uh, to continue with uh, other ones. But as I mentioned in the conclusions, uh, it's not that easy when we start thinking about doing it. I mean, and there are some papers already trying to extending these approaches to other types. And it's and it's a difficult uh, a difficult thing. Uh, it's difficult in evaluation. It's difficult. I mean, yeah. But the idea is yes, of course. Okay. 
Hi, thank you for the nice talk. So um, I was thinking about these other perspectives of how we could think about how to remove the problem of gender bias or biases in general. Um, as you said, uh, these models are actually made for learning biases, so it's actually very difficult probably to make them not learning biases. But some of the um, examples that you provided were cases where um, essentially um, the model was caring too much about the information that was coming with the word uh, and was not relying on the context information, which were, as a, whereas this was actually telling you, wait, hey, this is a, a woman. Uh, so maybe the problem is not only like the information that is encoded in the embeddings, but rather um, failure at encoding contextual information sufficiently. And I was wondering what you think about this. Yeah, totally. I mean, I, you are right. Um, and in fact, uh, in when the transformer came for the first time, they, they, they say that it was better in, in encoding contextual information. Uh, but obviously, it's failing there. It's, it's failing. Uh, and this is related to what I said, you know, that gender bias is about accuracy. So if we make our systems better in, 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 in all these things, uh, in, in learning, uh, in learning context, to context and so on, we are going to progress in this field even if we are not working in this. But still, um, what, what happens and we, what we should fight uh, when, is that when contextual information sometimes it's enough, but it's enough if uh, the stereotype is not so strong. So in the example that I know, Jocelyn is a female, he works as a, if, if there was not this strong, so it was, um, Jocelyn is a female, uh, she works as a nurse, I'm, I, I'm sure that she, it will output she, because it's learning that it's a female. It's learning, but it's, it's not strong enough to compete with the stereotypes and, and all this. So yeah, uh, uh, obviously, if we, you are learning better context, you will remove a gender bias in a certain amount. question over here. Uh, thank you very much for, the, for your talk. So I was wondering, in the initial riddle that you mentioned, the doctor could also be another man, right? Yeah, yeah, of and course. Then, of course, yeah, yeah. By trying to remove a bias, you're introducing another one. Uh, yeah, yeah, and that's, that's, that's even more complicated and this is something that, that I should have mentioned because we sometimes mention it and, and then there is, okay, we are, you could also argue that we are making gender a, bi a binary bi uh, variable when it is not anymore vari uh, binary, so, uh, okay, yeah, but yeah, exactly, this comes also to the extension, I, I would say these are ex uh, I guess uh, also extensions of the of the problem. So, if you like, this is a way of uh, the, the problem is so, so complicated that, as I see, it, this is a way to start and propose things, but there is a long way to go. Okay, but it's at least at least let's start. Yeah, I don't know. It's <laughs> super nice. And then related to that, it's what does it mean that it's unbiased? Like. Is there a definition of when something is not biased that you can say, okay, this is the universal description of if I achieve that, I, I will be so happy, right? Because it's tricky to say that, no? Because if you go to maybe other practical cases in which, I don't know, just imagine cancer, right? And then you know that for women or for women, like some things are more effective than others, etc. If you start removing bias in there, then you're removing information. And in many other things, you, you have to, by definition, assume bias. So what does it mean that something is unbiased? Okay, the definition, I, I'm not going to get into that because it's a very philosophical soci sociologist definition and I, I, I do not think I have the knowledge to expose a, a definition of that. But uh, what uh, I would work towards and I see and mentioning, for example, the. The, ex the example that you just mentioned of cancer and so on. So there have there are other industries that have been here before. Uh, for example, uh, medical healthcare. No, so they what they did is that 20 years ago they had this uh, clinical 
sets, uh, they, uh, clinical sets, uh, trials, and so on, that they were done only on men, 70 kilos, uh, uh, European, and whatever. Maybe 80 kilos. No? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. But all the, those, those uh, products, uh, medical products, went into, into, into commercialization, and women, for example, or children, were, uh, had problems with these medications, no? And they have already solved that by doing clinical trials that are representation of the entire, of, of at least more variable, no? So what I, what I, I do not know what is not biased, but I know that we have to better represent uh, the different cultures, the, the, the gender, the, the, the races, and so on. So, uh, uh, we ha while we are working on the definition that I don't mind, we can go work towards this direction that it is making our systems more representative. Thank you. Okay, we have time for a final question. Hi, Marta. Nice talk. Really nice talk. Um, I also maybe related to the bias scene. Um, I also uh, noticed in the PCA decomposition, you put it right, so in the energy of the eigenvectors compared to the null model. And you show that the, not only the first component, right, has a high energy, but also there are other components with a higher component, energetic component, compared to the null model. So maybe this is also related to the, this dichotomic or binary decision on the gender, right? What do you think? Yeah, yeah, we, uh, yeah, uh, totally, uh, totally right. I, I mean, I, I haven't, to be uh, sincere, I haven't thought uh, we haven't discussed about this. Uh, what could be the second component? Uh, in fact, it was already uh, proposed in the original paper in words embeddings. This uh, gender space uh, proposal for words embeddings, and they had also this thing. Uh, yeah, I, I mean, I have no answer for that. There are more biases than just gender, right? Maybe. Uh, yeah, yeah, of course. <laughs> <laughs> That's, yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah. Uh, I've been told that there somebody called here for a question. Yeah, okay. Thanks. Hi. Thanks for the talk, firstly. And I wonder. I was wondering, uh, how did you define your bias list and your standard bias list? Uh, yeah, uh, this this is easy because we took it from the from the words embeddings uh, original paper, uh, that the bias in words embeddings original paper, and they did that by using Amazon uh, mechanical torques uh, to um, to design, which are. Uh, words that are supposed to be neutral, but uh, with, with uh, this association test, uh, they are biased. Okay, so and I was trying to get a better representation of the room, so if there's any other uh, question <laughs> around here. <laughs> thank you, Luis. <laughs> mm -hmm. That's fine. No? Okay, so then let's thank uh, our speaker again for a very nice talk. So, uh, so our ne next talk is going to be given by Gemma Boleda. Gemma is an ICRA research professor at the Pompeu Fabra University in Barcelona, and she's the head of the CALT group, which is for computational linguistics and linguistic theory and she's going to talk about short-term meaning shift. Thanks. Thanks. So I'm presenting joint work with Marco del Tredici and Raquel Fernandez, who are both Barcelona products, uh, currently at the University of Amsterdam. And actually, Marco is going to present a poster after this uh, session, so make sure to, to check it out. And uh, it's funded by the, um, by the European Research Council. All right. So. Um, my recent research has all been um, focused around like uh, the dual nature of language and specifically how language conveys meaning. Um, what do I mean by that? Like uh, on the one hand, word meaning, a word like mug, the representation that we have has to be 
generic enough that we can apply it to really varied uh, objects, uh, objects with different um, sizes, shapes, colors, uh, etc. But on the other hand, when we use a word in a specific context, like here, for instance, I bought this mug in Barcelona and I really like it, then it's not generic anymore. It's really like we mean a specific object that is tied to a specific situation. And this tension between like more generic and more situation-specific aspects of meaning, um, it's kind of like it crops up everywhere, in both in how language works and also in computational modeling. And then what I'm going to present is a, is a case study where we find this tension. So in uh, just a quick wrap up, um, in computational linguistics, the, um, the predominant approach to word meaning is to basically take uh, word use in context, so where we find, for instance, sentences in text corpora containing the word mug, and then kind of distill all these occurrences of specific uses of a word, but then abstracting over many, many, many such uses, and then come up with some kind of vectorial representation by learning a mapping between these contexts and uh, the word vectors or word embeddings in, in current parlance. And I'm going to refer to this as the distributional approach, uh, as is uh, common in, in a tradition I've been working on, because it's based on distributions of words in context, all right? But essentially, we have this mapping from context to, to, word, to word, uh, some kind of word meaning representation. All right, and in recent years, there's been quite a bit of interest in modeling uh, not only word meaning, but also word meaning shift or semantic change. Because words don't get defined once and for all. Uh, they really evolve dynamically as users, uh, as speakers use the language, they, uh, word meanings kind of shift uh, across time. And here we have an example of a previous work in which we have the word gay that came, that evolved in the last century from a meaning close to witty or, or cheerful to uh, its current predominant meaning as homosexual, all right? And uh, this has been modeled with distributional methods uh, with the following assumption. So when words change in meaning, then they also change their distribution. They also change the context in which they are used. And here we have an example. So in 1900, we have a sentence like, we assembled around the breakfast with spirits as gay and appetites as sharp as ever. So that would be the, the first meaning. And then in 2000, we find sentences like the expectation that effeminate men and masculine women are more likely to be seen as gay men and lesbians, respectively, right? Clearly reflecting this change in meaning. So because the word has changed, then the context, uh, these, these contexts are very different, uh, the one from 1900 to the one of, of 2000. Now, so we have this, this like causal relationship between a change in meaning and a change in, in context, and what distributional approaches do is they re reverse the causality. So they take the context, they see, okay, let's see when there's a change in context, and then we are going to infer that the word has changed. So that's how distributional approaches to, to, to semantic change or meaning shift work. Um, in previous work, um, the time scale at which um, uh, people have worked is, is really long. Like uh, we call this long-term meaning shift because they worked on decades or centuries. Like this example here, it took really decades for this word to evolve. And typically what happens is word, word change, meaning, uh, semant sorry, meaning shift arises in a specific community and then it slowly spreads through the language until it reaches like the yeah, general status, so to speak. And uh, so to be able to observe uh, semantic shift, typically people have needed, you know, these longer time, time, time scales for two reasons. One is this thing that uh, it takes time for uh, a shift to propagate to the whole community. And the other one is, uh, as we all know, um, data-driven methods are data-hungry and we need a lot of data to be able to estimate good, good word, word embeddings. Now, what we wanted to do, however, is to try to get as close as possible to the genesis of semantic change. Like to as like kind of try to track semantic shift as it is occurring, right? And so we went, uh, so we call this short-term meaning shift uh, because we are operating on shorter terms. It's still like longish in the sense that uh, we, we, we went as short as we could uh, with current uh, methods in distributional, in distributional uh, semantics, which is four years. So we studied change from 2013 to 2017. 
And we studied it in a specific community because, as I said, that's where, that's where um, meaning change, um, that's how it emerges. Um, in particular, we focused on um, an online community, Reddit. I don't know if you're aware of it. It's just some kind of forum where people exchange uh, messages about, um, about some topic. And we did the Liverpool Football Club just because Marco is a soccer fan, so he chose that topic. And just to get, give you an idea of what kind of data we have, so people say something like, they comment on Van Dyke with some kind of coach saying to an eight-year-old child, you support Everton, tough, isn't it? Must be very tough. And then people kind of comment on this and talk endlessly about, about soccer things. And uh, so we scraped uh, Reddit, and in particular this community of uh, soccer fans. And um, Again, to give you an idea of the kind of data that we are working with, um, this, is, uh, this is an example of the, of the meaning change that we, that we found. Here you see the word F5. Uh, in the first sentence, you have the typical meaning. Uh, it says, damn, after losing the F5 key on my keyboard. That's just the F5 key. And then slowly, it starts getting on an added meaning. Uh, he is so close, F5 tapping is so intense now, don't think about it too much, man, just F5. I slept and just woke up and thought it was F5 time. This was a happy F5. So as you can see, this F5, which is uh, used to refresh the page, it's slowly, well, not so slowly as we will see, but <laughs> it's being associated to a meaning of like expectation, right? It's kind of changing the meaning to expectation and anticipation. And uh, these, um, these examples, um, the first one is from June the 16th in 2017, and the last one is from the July the 3rd. So this change, this semantic shift, occurred in literally two weeks. And in fact, we find you know this poor guy who connected after a couple of weeks and goes like, what is an F5, right? If you don't have the context, then it's kind of difficult to accommodate if you haven't been in the, in the exchange, right? Um, all right. So, we, we wanted to explore this kind of data, and what we did is adopting a method from previous research, is to train standard, if you're familiar with it, word to vec embeddings uh, with data up to 2013. So this would be a uh, laser. So this here, it's not working. The one on the left would be um, our normal word embeddings represented as dots, in a, as points in a three-dimensional space. Of course, we have many more dimensions. And then what we do is we, we freeze these weights, we, we, take, well, we, we take those weights, and then we feed the algorithm data uh, from 2017, all right? So we take the 2013 embeddings and we keep training them with new data. And the idea is that most words, because they don't change meaning, they don't change context, they will remain more or less in the same place that they were in 2013. But some words, will change meaning and then they will change context and then they will move. And here we have an example, just an illustration, it's not a real visualization. F5 will probably have shifted somewhere around there. And then we can use the distance between the representation in 2017 compared to the one in 2013 to see whether something has happened or not, right? And the, re the results are, 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 are good, like uh, we get a correlation of 0.49 with human data that we collected as part of this study. Um, um, it's, it's Pearson correlation, so it's between, well, in this case, between zero and one, uh, and, and, and higher is better. So it's good, but it, it's decent. There, we find something there, but there's clearly also a lot of noise, right? It's not perfect, it's not 0.8 or, or 0.9. And what we found in the error analysis is a lot of false positives, meaning the model spotted some change in, in context and was like, hey, here there's a change in meaning. But our humans were like, no, no change whatsoever, like zero. Uh, and we found quite a bit of those. And um, in analysis, we uh, saw that this actually had to do with situation-specific effects or like con contextual referential effects. Uh, namely, that words are used almost exclusively to refer to a specific event or, or, or entity that is relevant in 2017 and maybe was not relevant in 2013, right? So, for instance, the word stubborn was used to refer to a coach who joined uh, Liverpool in 2015. So, whenever, like, it was really used only to refer to that entity. Or, uh, actually, we found the word independence that was used to refer to the political facts in, in Catalonia in 2017. 
all right? And in these cases, the, because they were used for a specific you know, thing, the, um, the, change, the, the context changed. In fact, it got narrower, and we have quantitative evidence in the paper that it got narrower. Uh, so the problem here is that this hypothesis that a change in meaning will be reflected in a change of context is, is true. We do find also uh, uh, true positives. But uh, often, a change in context does not imply a change in meaning. All right? So uh, that fools the, the, the model, so to speak. And this is because uh, these models, like word embeddings that are not contextual, nothing, they cannot really distinguish between generic and situation-specific effects in language. And why? Because they lack mechanisms to connect word representations, these generic things that we have abstracted from data, to the situational context that, that they are used in. All right? Um, one of the cool things, coolest for me, things that deep learning has given us uh, for language is a native mechanism to incorporate both word representation and so the contextual information into 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 our, you know, into our models. Um, this is an RNN uh, that that incorporates not only word information that are the green ones, but also a representation of the context that are the blue hidden layers there. Uh, and in principle, we can account for much more now. I will not talk about this because uh, my colleague Laura Aina is going to to talk about this later in this session. So, so uh, bear bear with me. All right. So to conclude, so this this has been uh, just a case study. We have other studies. If you're interested, uh, check check our website. Um, that showcases this kind of interplay between kind of generic aspects of meaning and more situation-specific ones. And this is a topic that really arises, arises like not only in meaning shift, but also in any, uh, anything having to do with language. You really have to account for the, for the context of use, and, and that's, I think that's the next frontier. I mean, in theory, like, we are going there with Elmo and Bert and these kind of things, but there's still a long way to go, as, as you will see. Um, finally, a plug. I hope the organizers don't, mark, don't mind. If you like this topic and this interplay between like generalization and more like uh, uh, inference in, in situation-specific context, please come to the Gecko workshop in, on May 18th in the Universitat Pompeu Fabra. And I'm done here. Thanks. Hi. Thanks for the very good talk. We have. Uh, Three minutes for questions. Now I have time for questions. <laughs> uh, I'm curious to see uh, why did you select the corpus of and uh, the Liverpool part of corpus of the Sorry, is it why or where? Uh, no, why did you focus on one of a specific domain and not use just all the data? Because, I mean, words are, can change the meaning with respect to another domain, not within the same one. So why did you...? Well, it was actually a bit more complex than that. So what we wanted to do is to focus on a specific community of users that interact, right? Because that's where, simply that's why, that's where meaning change uh, uh, um, arises. and and. It actually arises because you're, I think, because you're talking about specific things and then those things feed back into your representation. So we wanted really to focus on, an, on a community. We did an online community because we need text. Uh, ideally, we would like to, you know, be able to, but anyway, do, do much more than what we do at the moment. Um, and we had a control because it's true that domain effects also, also are there, like for instance, oops. So for instance, uh, I'll, I'll just leave this. So, for instance, in the in the soccer uh, in soccer, uh, the word box does not really refer usually to the box, but to this thing where like the ball goes through the you know yeah. goalpost, and and this is domain specific. So we have a control that says, okay, we're taking the generic language, and also we are we are controlling that we are not affected by domain factors, and then and then from there we start really with the soccer community, the Liverpool FC. To, to track things that are really community specific. Okay, so I think I'm not. I think I'm not addressing your question directly. Am I? Yeah, I mean, you explicitly want to exclude the domain effects. Yes. Okay. Yes. So yeah. we have some. 
I think we had, uh, so we had some, so Marco and Raquel have some other article that talks about domain, domain specific uh, uh, changes. But in this study, we wanted to exclude those and, and they are excluded. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, I can give you more details later in the, in the coffee break. Thank you. Uh, thank you for such a nice talk, Gemma. Uh, I have a general, generic question, but it's, it just came to my mind. Uh, how uh, this relates to continuous learning? It could be like the problem that we are addressing in lifelong learning, where our systems adapt. Uh, I mean, it's, it's the same problem that you are addressing. Because, I mean, there have been very little work in continuous learning uh, in natural language processing. In fact, we are trying to do that in, in machine translation. We, we are doing that task in WMT this year for the first time. But there has been a long, a lot, a lot in image uh, processing and so on. Mm -hmm. And I wonder if this is this what you could yeah. be considered like this problem. I think it is in the sense that when, when typically, well, Partially. So if you assume that the traditional view, you train your word embeddings once and for all, and this is your meaning representation. And then, of course, like it's, it's a good approximation, but then when you deploy it for a specific community or a specific dialect or specific, then you're lost, right? So in a way, you want systems that can adapt these meaning representations, and ideally, that can do it fast. So I didn't talk about this much, but this is related to slow learning versus fast learning, right? And you want to adapt fast if you want to be able to make sense of what people talk about in these online communities, for instance. So it is, it is, uh, it is related in the sense that we need to always not, not just assume a fixed representation, but really adapt them as, as the data evolves. And in theory, because if you take, for instance, language modeling, or I guess machine translation, the word embeddings do change as you keep processing data, right? So, so in theory, you can adapt them. But the problem is that typically this adaptation process is way too slow for this kind of thing, right? So I think it, it is somehow related. Uh, and I think that the, 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 the key word here is the problem of fast learning rather than one of, because in principle, we have the mechanisms to be able to do continual learning. Just keep on processing data and the word embeddings will change. So the problem is more the adaptation to specific situations and that, that, that kind of fast learning part and the catastrophic forgetting and all these things, rather than not being able to do it in principle. Thank you, Jim. Okay, I think that in the interest of time, we have to shift to the next talk. Thanks a lot uh, again, uh, Gemma. And if there are more questions, I guess you can take them offline during the coffee break. So next speaker, yeah, thanks a lot. So it's Luis Espinoza Hanke. He's a lecturer at the University of Cardiff. He's gonna talk about augmenting word embeddings with unsupervised relations. Hello. It works? Yep, it should work. okay. Yeah. Um, well, hi everyone, uh, good morning, and uh, thank you for having me. Um, we're going to, I'm going to talk about uh, research directions that we've been uh, focusing on quite a bit for the last two years or so in our research lab, um, which is that of uh, explicitly encoding uh, relational information in, in vector spaces. Um, so the talk's going to be divided in three, in three blocks. First, I'll talk about relations in, in, in word embeddings, uh, strengths and limitations, and based on these limitations, uh, discuss a little bit our proposed model uh, for encoding explicit uh, relations between pairs of words or concepts, and then a couple of use cases for downstream applications where we can use these relation vector models in, in downstream NLP. Okay, so let's talk about relations in word embeddings. Um, at this point, already everybody knows that um, um, in NLP, it's, it's common practice to encode a, a word as a low dimensional vector. And uh, these vectors uh, compress uh, sem both semantic and syntactic properties. And, and this, this information comes from co current statistics. No, and, and we know this. And we also know, uh, bec because of the uh, uh, very famous man is to, queen, is to king as woman is to queen example, that there are certain relations that can be uh, inferred uh, or induced based on simple vector difference operations. And this is, and, and this is a uh, well-known figure from the word to vec paper where we can see, for example, that the capital of relation is very well preserved in, in the vector space because the directions are similar. So on the left, we have uh, countries, and on the right ha hand side of the, of the visualization, we have uh, capital cities. 
Um, the reason why this uh, actually happens uh, can be summarized in this quote. Uh, I'll, I'll read it. Uh, the key operation in these models is vector difference or vector offset. Uh, for example, the Paris uh, minus France vector appears uh, to encode capital of uh, relation, presumably by canceling out the features of Paris that are France specific and retaining the features that distinguish a capital city. So this more or less summarizes the reason why this analogical uh, reasoning unsupervised uh, works the way it works. And there's been quite a lot of work out there uh, exploring other uh, semantic, like uh, syntactic relations and whether they are preserved or not in, in vector spaces. So this is an ACL paper from 2014 where they show, uh, they study the, the phenomenon of, of hypernemy is a relation. No? And a little bit fast forward, last year, calling 2018, uh, this uh, paper where they show uh, that it also uh, occurs in, in the superlative degree. So this is a kind of relation between adjectives uh, and their superlative counterpart, like good, best, bad, worst, or fast, fastest. So this is an, uh, also a kind of relation that can be well preserved uh, simply by looking at the directions of the instances of the relation type. Um, but there are other relations that do not. No? And the, in that paper, they show that the mer meronymy relation uh, that's part of, for example, a wheel is a part of a car, or a uh, door is part of a house or a building, um, they, 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 that relation is all over the place. So there's a, 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 a model based on vector difference would not be able to capture as well as other relations, the relation of meronymy. And it's really difficult to really tell which relations are, are uh, adapt well to this offset model and which uh, do not. Um, but one possible uh, approach to alleviate this is to explicitly encode a relational information in, in vector spaces. So the, the goal, uh, and this is what we've been working on uh, recently, is to compute a, a vector space uh, for a pairs of words such that there exists certain relation between them. Uh, it should be unsupervised, so ideally we shouldn't rely on the edges of any predefined uh, inventory, a knowledge graph or an ontology, but rather let uh, statistics tell us which words are, uh, well, uh, are more uh, likely to be uh, involved in, cert in a certain semantic relation. It should be computationally feasible and should scale to millions of relations. And, and ideally, you know, it should be useful. It should be both useful for language analysis and corpus linguistics and for uh, natural language processing. Um, so the first model that we uh, proposed was presented in, in Colling uh, last year. And the idea is, uh, and the model is, uh, well, it's, it's, it's three, three steps that I'll, I'll go uh, over uh, Right now, so the first uh, part is the simplest uh, possible uh, pre-selection of word pairs that we, can, we could think of, which, is, which was to compute uh, pairwise uh, association metrics between, uh, between a predefined vocabulary. And then for each pair of words, we compute a, a, a context embedding and then we want to purify that relation uh, with, with, uh, with an autoencoder. And I'll, I'll say a bit more about uh, two and three now. Um, so consider a sentence that mentions the words A and B, which um, we know that co-occur often enough because the, 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 the PMI between them is, is high enough. No? So what we do is we take the centroid vector for all the words that appear before A um, for some predefined uh, 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 word embedding model. We do the same for the mid context for words occurring between A and B and for words occurring after B. So effectively, we have three context vectors simply by taking the centroid of the words that happen in the three possible contexts that we can have. And then we do the same for cases where they occur flipped. And then we, we do a yet another averaging. We like a lot of averaging. We do another averaging over all the sentences uh, that contain A and B. So we average all the pre uh, contexts, all the mid contexts, and all the post contexts, and also the, the, the ones uh, for the, for the other, for the other uh, direction. Uh, so this results in a very fast to compute uh, vector that encodes the relations between A and B, but um, it has, uh, basically it has uh, two limitations. One of them is they're large vectors, and depending on the size of the pair vocabulary, it may not be tractable. Um, and 
another limitation is that we are considering all words occurring in the context of A and B to have the same weight. And intuitively, for modeling the relation between them based on, 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 on corpus evidence, we would like to have a way to give more weight uh, to words that are actually telling us something about the relation and less weight to words that are uh, telling us something about A, about B, or are simply there uh, 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 coincidentally or, or, si or because of, uh, of uh, situational reasons. So our proposed uh, method to, to, to address this is to run these, uh, and as you can see, it's 1800 dimensional uh, uh, context vectors if you use a 300 dimensional pre-trained uh, model, which is fairly standard. Um, the, the way we, we, we do this is by running these uh, uh, Lo uh, high dimensional relation vectors through an autoencoder. Uh, you know, autoencoders uh, compress uh, representation and try to reconstruct your own input. Um, but then the decoder has access to the word embeddings of A and B themselves. So in a way, what we're hoping to do is to uh, force the network to uh, reconstruct the relation vector, uh, but not by uh, not looking at any of the information that uh, is about A and B because we're giving it to it uh, explicitly. So ideally, that compressed representation after training should contain information uh, we encoded in the average uh, context vector, but only that that is not relevant to A and B alone, if that makes sense. Um, and then uh, and we can go as uh, low dimensional as maybe five or 10 dimension uh, relation, relation vectors. Uh, we can use this uh, to improve the similarity structure of word embedding models. Uh, uh, it's been uh, uh, fairly studied that there's a strong correlation between uh, similarity structure in vector spaces and uh, quality of, of, of downstream applications. Any supervised model that takes us input word embeddings is, it will benefit if the similarity structure, because it correlates very well with meaning, is well preserved. So one way uh, to improve a baseline, simply taking the cosine similarity between, between two words, is to select the neighbors and the relation vectors that maximize the sum of the cosine similarities between uh, neighbors and, and relation vectors. And once we have a, a, a highly relevant neighbor and a highly relevant relation vector for uh, um, 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 getting a signal of, of similarity between W1 and W2, then we, well, we, we in, in that paper we experimented with different ways, concatenating one or the two of them, and uh, maybe uh, toning down a bit uh, some of them, and there, there was a little bit of tuning. Um, and in the end, uh, there's a, there are certain configurations that actually uh, improve across the board the similarity structure of, of, a, of a baseline word embedding model. Um, and this is a table from uh, an Ichikai paper uh, from last year where we proposed another model for, for w which basically is another way of giving more weight to, to words uh, that are uh, relevant to the relation. And as we can see there, uh, simply using these average based uh, relation vectors is still competitive. Um, and here's a, a f I'll, f I'll, f I'll end now with, with a plot twist. Um, so We've seen uh, that word embeddings can capture syntactic, semantic, and some relational knowledge. And we've seen, um, well, at, at least I've, I've, I hope I've convinced you that relation vectors can be used for uh, encoding and, and inducing explicit re uh, um, uh, relation representations. But what if uh, we could use those relation vectors to compress relational knowledge back into word embeddings and simply have your classic word embedding model that you know that is, which, that is more uh, likely to encode relational information. That would be great, no? Uh, so it, it turns out that we can. Um, in ACL last year, we presented a, a paper on relational word embeddings. And again, no, this is a simple approximation where we take a relation vector, uh, can be a seven-like vector or any other uh, model, and we train a neural network that predicts that relation vector from a operation over word embeddings. Uh, we've seen that taking the vector difference uh, is uh, common practice. It's also been shown that concatenating that with uh, multiplicative features uh, get, gives a little bit of, of, of additional information. And these relational word embeddings are useful for uh, classifying, for encoding relations. And these relations are uh, 
can be used, for example, for uh, lexical for relation classification or for predicting, for training classifiers that predict whether for a certain concept a feature is relevant or not. Uh, so these are experiments in a data set of, of, uh, to predict whether uh, a, a pair feature concept or entity are associated or not. Um, okay, so that's more or less uh, 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 what, what I had to say. Uh, I hope I convinced you that word embeddings capture uh, relational knowledge, but only to a certain extent. Uh, that is feasible to compute millions of relation vectors uh, for, uh, actually, uh, the applications, we're still exploring them. So we were, uh, it, it's, it, it's something that we're still working on. Um, um, and, and personally, I think uh, doing a corpus linguistics with this explicit relational knowledge is a highly promising avenue. Um, we have seen that this can be fed back into, re into word embeddings themselves. And of course, uh, another direction is to uh, explore the specialization or the inclusion of explicit relational information in uh, contextualized word embeddings or, or transformers, which is something that I guess uh, man, uh, many people are working now at, at the moment. Okay, so we've got code and pre-trained models for these three papers, so feel free to have a look at them. And yeah, that's it, thank you. Thank you. Time uh, for one, two questions. No questions? Just over there. Over there. Okay, thank you. <coughs> thank you, great talk. Um, so I wanted to ask uh, what kind of relations do you think uh, impact the most uh, the, the embeddings in terms of? evaluating the embeddings in downstream tasks as well as, for example, word similarity or other tasks that uh, are also uh, quite common? Mm. I would say, well, uh, first, not make uh, uh, di dif dif differentiate between uh, lex uh, syntactic, morphological, and syntactic, rela uh, syntactic relations. No, I guess that 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 those are uh, better. Uh, sh uh, those are shown to be better preserved. So, uh, uh, inflection, uh, j uh, number. Oh, these these relations are are fairly better preserved. Um, as for, seman for semantic relations, the ones that you may find in WordNet or any, o any ontology or a knowledge graph, that's a, that's a good question, actually. Really, it's, it's, it's difficult. That paper I showed uh, from 2016, on the, that defect paper, um, they show that there are certain relations that you can base predict uh, almost with 100% accuracy only with a difference vector, uh, but others not. Um, um, it's it's really hard to tell, and I don't ha my mem I, I, I I don't remember them I exactly. Um, mm -hmm. But we found very problematic the collectivity uh, type of relation. So when there's one individual instance and one collective instance, like a tree and a forest, uh, these types of, of relations uh, are uh, th that 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 is a difficult one to 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 predict and to encode. Yes, because there was uh, there's a lot of work about synonyms, antonyms, and hypernemy, but uh, I was wondering what other um, uh, relations uh, or uh, how would you you know uh, think uh, about uh, the the impact mm. of uh, I think this. it's it's a similar problem like topic modeling where you have a set of words that represent a domain. Here we have a certain rel uh, instances that may represent a, a relation type I when you look at clusters in the vector space. Um, but it's it, f well, it it's somewhat interpretable. But after you run those through the autoencoder, the interpretability gets a little bit lost. Um, but one very interesting uh, task. Uh, we have a, a PhD student working on that at the moment is combining a knowledge base on a, or a knowledge graph with these unsupervised relation vectors and try to merge them together to label what kind of relations, uh, the, the clusters you get from text based on, on these uh, synthetic categories. Because th that in that way, you have some outliers that won't uh, belong to any category, and then you, you, can, you can play a little bit with, with those. But yeah, I agree, it's, uh, it's uh, and here uh, the challenge is that we cannot label them uh, in, a, in a direct way, uh, the clusters or the relation instances that, that get uh, uh, pred predicted, let's say, or, or induced. Uh. Okay, thank you. I guess we are uh, over time, uh, but uh, thanks again for a very nice talk. Sure.
And you can take more questions offline. Um, yeah, so the last but not least um, talk of the session is going to be given by Laura Aina. She's a PhD student at the Colt um, Group at the uh, Pompeo Fabri University. And she's going to explain how we can put words in context. <laughs> okay, thank you. Thank you for the introduction and good morning, everybody. I'm going to be presenting joint work with uh, Cristina Gulordava and Gemma Boleda. Um, so our work starts from a pretty uh, fundamental and pervasive fact about natural language, which is that uh, there is not a one-to-one -one correspondence between words and meanings. Um, I mean, it would be very easy for us to do NLP if that was the case, but you know, if we encounter a word like, like a form, like show, um, sometimes it's a verb, so let, let me show you my new bike, and sometimes it's a noun, her new show airs tonight, and uh, sometimes it's also a noun, but it actually means something slightly different. You can have like a TV show, an art show, a convention, and they all are intended using the same word. So in context, we have to always do a little bit of work to infer what is the intended meaning of, for that particular word. And um, this is a challenge also for deep learning models. Um, uh, because um, <clears throat> usually in a standard uh, deep learning model, such as, for instance, here we can look at a, like a, an RNN uh, model independently of the objective. If we process, um, we process the sequence uh, of the language, and whenever whatever we get to a particular word, we pass this information in the form of an embedding. And well, again, in the standard case, this embedding is static. It's learned through the uh, training of the model and remains the same independently of the meaning of the word. So, you know, I will pass the same embedding for show independently of whether it's a noun or a verb or any other nuances in between. And um, as, you know, Marta was talking about these word embeddings encode biases and they are not only related to, you know, for instance, gender, but also like they encode biases about senses. So they will reflect basically the statistical distribution over senses and if a word um, is very often, for instance, used as a verb, they will accumulate more information about that sense rather than another one. And so, for instance, in this case, uh, we take this information from a, a language model. Um, it, you know, the embedding of show is close to mostly uh, the verb sense as words. It will also encode the other type of information. But, you know, in context, you might want to do a little work to actually try to um, um, adapt to the, to the right meaning. And... Um, but of course, you know, the, the thing doesn't end there. Uh, you go to the hidden state after you, that you process this word embedding and then there you might actually process this information, put it together with the context and get to the right information. And we actually have overwhelming evidence that this is probably the case, uh, given that, I mean, all the trends that have been appearing the last couple of years about using internal representations of language models um, as a transfer learning to other models. So we know that they contextualize information to some extent. Um, but our question here is how do they do it, what kind of strategy do they employ, and to which extent do they contextualize word information versus other type of information such as sentence structure and so on. And our contribution is a method of analysis that will allow us to investigate this and can be applicable to, it can be applied to different types of model. So um, I am going to introduce some kind of um, metaphor here just to allow us to sort of imagine what I'm talking about. Uh, the idea is that, um, you know, we can think of word embeddings as information that is encoding information as, like, about different types of meanings that could be relevant to different types of context. And um, the process under which we get to resolve such ambiguity um, can be imagined. Like, one hypothesis could be that, you know, we start off with such um, ambiguous information and then as an output of a modulation process we only get to focus on the information that is relevant to the context so like a subset of the original information and so the question that we raise here is that if we were to actually be able to look at the word information that is encoded in hidden states would it look more like this kind of ambiguous under specified content uh, or would it be like only the information that is relevant to the context and of course, the underlining question behind this is also how can we actually check that? Because hidden state encode much more information than just word information, so, and they're not directly interpretable, for instance, in the space of words, so how can we actually compare that information to the information in the word embedding? 
Um, so in uh, natural language processing, it became uh, quite popular to employ what is known as supervised probing as a method to investigate the information that is encoded within hidden uh, states of a uh, deep learning model. Um, the idea here is that uh, we want to assess whether a some information it's encoded and so we define some kind of task that will target and will require to this information in order to solve the task for instance if we want to figure out if the hidden state is recognizing between different parts of speech we will i don't know do a part of speech tag uh, task and um, we then use as input to a simple machine learning model the hidden states from a pre-trained deep learning model that we want to evaluate and then we train this simple architecture to do the task and of course, the, the, this diagnostic model will only be good to the extent that the information is encoded in the, in the representation that we're giving as input. And so we can use the success on the test data as a measure of how much that information that we were interested in the first place is encoded um, in the hidden representations. And that has been applied to different types of tasks from like syntactic agreement to start with. And um, usually these are classification tasks. And uh, now, of course, how do we adapt it to our purposes? Um, so we uh, operationalized this as a task of extracting word representations out of hidden states. So the idea is that we want to compare two types of word representations, one that looks more like the one to the right, so something ambiguous, and the other one, the one to the left, that is specific to the context. And so the idea is, okay, so if we have this kind of target representations, we can learn, train a nonlinear transformation, just well, like one layer, we train it with a, to maximize the similarity between uh, you know, the transformed representation and the target one. And um, then what do we use as objectives though? And we compare two cases crucially. In one case, we try to extract the word embedding. So a context invariant representation that it's actually was the input that the hidden states are received. So it's like training like the model to reconstruct its original input, and that will be a measure of how much it's able to, like how much it retained that information, if it can reconstruct it back. And in the other case, we compare it with a contextual representation. So something that is n only focusing on the information that is relevant to the context. And so if the model has, doesn't include any more the information that is not relevant, it should be better at reconstruct the second than the first one. But of course, I mean, uh, we can easily get the former, it's just part of the model, but how can we get the second, uh, which is a bit of a challenge. And our solution here is to uh, use uh, lexical substitution data. These are data that are usually used as a benchmark to evaluate uh, uh, word representations in context um, or other types of, of models. And we basically reverse engineer the task. So usually what you want is a representation that um, if it's good, it's going to be closer to words that are appropriate paraphrases of the word in context uh, in comparison to words that are not good paraphrases. So uh, you have occurrences of a word in context, like show, for instance, here. And as you can see, depending on the context, people annotated the, uh, the data with different sub words that could have been alternatively be used. Uh, so our solution here is to um, basically construct contextual representations as a function of the substitutes, and in particular, a function of the substitutes embeddings. So we will basically, in practice, we use some kind of simple averaging mechanism where we put together the word information, the target word information with the substitute information. So this will be going in a different directions in the space depending on what is the contextual meaning of the word. And then, you know, as I said before, we train with these different objectives. Sometimes we retrieve these representations in one case, and in the other case, we retrieve the word embedding. So the, what I've said so far doesn't actually um, have, um, doesn't commit us to use any particular architecture as long as we have word embeddings and hidden states, we can apply this method. And also doesn't any particular objective to start with. However, um, in this uh, paper, uh, the, the ACL paper, we actually applied it uh, to a bidirectional LSTM, a language model. So in this case, uh, the task is uh, given the context predict another word, uh, and um, in this case, uh, you know, uh, we, we do the word prediction by basically taking into account both the left and the right context uh, jointly. And um, so in this case, uh, um, yeah, so it, and then we have, it's important to note that basically like, you know, at the output, we are doing some word prediction task, and at the input, we actually have to process the input. So we introduce some kind of distinctions between hidden states. Uh, our main focus is on what we call processing hidden states. These will be um, states that, I mean, the one in, in blue, the ones that actually process the word embedding and have to put it together with the context. 
And, um, and then also predictive states, which do not see the word. So they, these are the pink ones. They do not observe the word embedding. They don't know which word is going to appear, but they have to predict it as output. So we contrast this because perhaps they, these two types of states, they do contain both of them information about, in this case, show, but maybe this is complementary in nature. Um, and so what we do is that we uh, extract the representation from all the layers, processing and predictive states, and we train a diagnostic model for each type of representation that all of them, they're just separately optimized. And then uh, we observe the way that um, the results on the test data. So um, our accuracy measure here is going to be, uh, well, the same that we used at training time. It's the cosine with respect to the ground truth representations. And um, we have uh, two types of results, as we had two different types of models. Uh, those that retrieve a context environment representation, the word embedding, uh, and the ones that retrieve a context representation, the function of the substitutes. And um, we report the results uh, for all the different layers that are showed on the x-axis. And um, we compare the results to the word embedding baseline, so just simply how the word embedding would do at the task if there was no contextualization at all. And of course, this is, has trivially a cosine of one with itself. And um, there are two important, uh, say, dimensions of the results. One is the comparison between the two tasks, and one is the, how the results change um, between like, going from the input to the output in the layers. And in those respects, we observed opposite patterns for processing and, hit and persistent hidden states. Um, so to start from processing states, the ones in blue, uh, we can see that uh, word information somehow, um, the, 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 the performances in the task degrade uh, going towards the output uh, in both tasks. And also that it's easier actually to reconstruct the original word embedding than a contextual version of it, which suggests that even though the model is actually able to do, to retrieve, um, you know, it's, it's, it's better than the baseline to be close to a, a contextual representation, it's still, the hidden states still somehow contain a lot of the original information from the word embedding. And um, on the other hand, for predictive states, we observe basically the opposite. We see that the information, um, the quality of the models improved going towards the output. And it is actually easier to extract contextual information than non-contextual one. And um, at the same time, though, the results are worse. And this is, can be explained because these models do not actually know which words is going to be uttered. So they have more uncertainty about it. And um, to give an, um, an intuition of how we can actually, um, like this was quite different from the original hypothesis that we had. So we expected that, you know, if contextualization can occur, this means that we get rid of the ambiguous information. So like you should expect that the, the, the purple dot is like more present than the, 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 the multicolor one. Uh, but in practice, we observed that contextualization is possible, um, but it's actually a lot of the original information is still retained. Um, and this is not the case for predictive states because they never observed the first kind of representation in, in the first place. So they can focus on more contextual properties, although they haven't observed the words, so they have more difficulties you know, in, 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 in predicting the right type of information. And also we observe that there is a, um, we can relate the results to the objective task. So in language modeling, um, you know, you have to do the word prediction at the output and you give, you, have, you, you know, at the input, you also get words. So what we see is that the results for predictive states improve towards the output. And that makes sense because they, probably they accumulate information as they approach the word prediction task where they actually have to predict that word concretely. And whereas for processing states, uh, you know, you actually, observe the word as input, and so you focus mostly on it at the beginning, and then as you approach the word prediction task where you predict another word, you are not focusing on that anymore. So there's probably a division of labor there. Um, and uh, so this is a summary of the things that we can observe about this particular type of model. Of course, there is no guarantee that we will observe the same patterns in another architecture, another um, objective, and so on, but the method that we presented, it it's can be applied to, to different types of, of models. And concretely, we are working on, on uh, applying this to different types of architectures, and in particular on BERT, which is at this point um, one of the most uh, used language models, especially for transfer learning. And another direction that we are also looking into is uh, some kind of alternative analysis methods that do not appeal um, to supervision, as we did here, so that we don't have to rely on this um, yeah, training setup. Thank you.
<laughs> Hi. So um, maybe time for one very short question. Nobody? So, uh, okay, so I suggest that we end uh, the session here because we are slightly over time. We go to the coffee break with the posters. If anybody has any question for, uh, what's the name, La Laura again, <laughs> sorry. I uh, so we're gonna use that time to make it uh, the question. So actually I have one, but uh, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna skip and uh, thank the speaker again and we go for the coffee. <laughs> Thanks a lot for the question. I guess